All right, welcome to discipleship number 10, discipleship class number 10. So I hope that those of you who are watching our videos were able to catch up with the audio lessons. If you haven't, then watching this discipleship number 10 video is going to be a little bit fast paced and you'll get lost. So I'd recommend please follow the homework assignments and that way you can understand. Okay, so I've been giving four basic doctrine lessons. So let's start with the first one. Uh, your lesson, the audio you were listening to was the devil, a.k.a. Satan. So that was the first lesson that you were learning. All right, the devil and Satan. I broke it down to the origin of Satan. So let's talk about his origin. All right, what I talked to you about his origin, that he was a created being from the Lord. That's Colossians 1.16. Not only that, uh, I also gave a little bit of the history of what happened with Satan. Two salient passages on this one about the origin of Satan is Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. Those are probably the two most important chapters on the origin of Satan. It's also used for the Genesis Gap teaching. In Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, Lucifer was the son of the morning, but he fell from his glorified position due to his pride and he wanted to take God's throne. So God had to kick him out. And then in Ezekiel 28, it shows right here that he was known to be a cherub. Because of his pride, he fell, and he, had, he lived all the way back in the Eden, the garden of God, and that he, had, he used to be a cherubim who covered the throne of God. So that one's a really interesting part that I mentioned. Uh, he was a cherubim who covered the throne of God. You can imagine, he was also a great singer, he was covered with all kinds of stones. Uh, right now, though, Satan, he lives in the air of our world, Ephesians 2.2, 2, and then he also has limited access to heaven, accusing God's children. That's found at Job 1, 6 through 12. So that's his origin, now his personality. So since you now know Satan's origin, um, it's going to be helpful once you know his origin. So then those of you who are like conspiracy buffs out there, once you know his, the basic doctrine and foundation of his origin in the Bible, a lot of other things that you would uh, watch or research concerning conspiracies will make sense about Satan's nature. All right, personality of Satan. Now, believe it or not, many do not believe Satan is a person. <laughs> but the Bible says that Satan is definitely a person. So, first of all, uh, I gave uh, three, per, uh, three verses, John 8, 44. He is a father to those who follow the lusts of the flesh. Okay, that's definitely a person. Not only that, Job 1, 6 through 12, he talks to God while accusing other. He accuses the saints while he talks to God. Now, if Satan is just an influence, not a person, an influence cannot talk, see? Uh, another thing is that uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 11, Satan, in this case, he is shown as a real person who possesses life, intelligence, willpower, and feelings. Now his character, character, pretty much the epitome of evil, right? His character, so he is known to be a thief, Matthew 13, 19. Two, he is subtle, 2 Corinthians 11, 3. Three, he's a murderer, John 8, 44. Four, he's a liar, John 8, 44. Five, he is a deceiver. All right. Um, actually, here's a bonus. I never mentioned this in the audio, so you can add this one. Number six, you can write down John 8, 44. Uh, he is a, what's the best word for this? He is lustful. He is lustful. So you, I think that's also important because it makes a lot of sense of demonic activity and sexual activity, especially in conspiracies and the antediluvian era of the sons of God, and maybe at the Garden of Eden, what he did with Eve. All right, but anyway, aside with that one, titles of Satan, titles of Satan. Okay, this one is very important. That way you can find out what Satan's name is in the Bible and you don't get lost. But here's another thing. A lot of people mess up. They actually think that this is not Satan, but it's a dinosaur, certain names. So I'm going to give you the verses to prove it. The audio lessons will give more convincing proof. Uh, number one, he's an angel of light. That's 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 14. 
Uh, I'm going to skip the verses here for time's sake. He's a roaring lion. That's number two. He is the prince of the power of the air. Number three. He is the dragon. He is known as the dragon or the serpent or the devil and Satan. And those are found in one verse, which is Revelation 12, 9. Revelation 12, 9. Okay, number five. He is the Leviathan. Okay, that's not some swimming dinosaur. I know that Ken Hoven, he's smart against evolution, but he's certainly not smart about the Bible. So that is not a dinosaur, and I gave you verses to prove that. He is also known as Behemoth. Behemoth. That is not a dinosaur. Uh, that's found at the book of uh, Job chapter 40, uh, verse 15. And not only that, uh, I also added uh, the verses right here. Uh, the most convincing proof, which I hope you listen to at your audio, is when you'll write down Job 4.19 as well as Isaiah 27.1. Isaiah 27.1 and Job 40 verse 19. When you connect those two verses together, there's no doubt this behemoth is the creature punished by God's sword like Leviathan was punished by God's sword and they are both chief of God's ways. Uh, and that is connected to Satan. So that is undoubtable proof. Behemoth is, has to be Satan. Okay, number seven, his title is the prince of this world. Eight, he is the god of this world. Number nine, he is Abaddon or Apollyon. He is Abaddon or Apollyon. Now, more accurately, that should be in reference to the Antichrist. The Antichrist. But... Um, him and the Antichrist are very similar in relationship, so it won't matter that much. Now, now there are some, okay, when you hear some KJV, there, there are some KJV Baptist pastors uh, who are anti-Semitic and who believe that the church will go through the tribulation. Some of them stupidly teach that Abaddon is some good guy angel. And then there are comments below the video, I kid you not, where people are saying, well, that's cool, you know, I love Abaddon, I love Apollyon. Oh my goodness, man. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, uh, number 10, he is a Christ. That's right, he is a Christ. That's why he's perfectly, he's perfect for Antichrist. Audio lesson explains more, Ezekiel 28, 14. Christ in Greek means anointed, see, and Ezekiel 28, 14 says that he's an anointed cherub. All right, 11, he is the author of confusion. 12, he is known as Beelzebub. 13, he is the king of Tyrus. 14, he is the god of forces. All right, subordinates of Satan. All right, Satan, he does have subordinates. And this is just basic doctrine. But when you go beyond basic doctrines, I'm sure you already know when you... Some of you conspiracy buffs out there, he has a lot of elites, evil connections, etc. The devil has a lot of interesting subordinates, connections. But in the Bible, it's simplified as this. One, evil spirits or devils, okay? Two, fallen angels. Those two are different, okay? They're not one and the same. Uh, I will give a different teaching on that eventually, okay? It's on basic doctrines, but if some of you want to go for a head start, Listen to demonology on basic doctrines if you want a head start on that. Okay, anyway, two is fallen angels. Three is death. Believe it or not, death is a, can be a subordinate of Satan, the grim reaper. Four, hell, hell. Five, sin and sinners who do his will. That can go on with conspiracies, right? Number six, religions and ministers. You can see a lot of connections with that one too. Number seven, the world. Well, no kidding, especially elites. Number eight, Here's an important one. Number eight, you wouldn't believe who's the subordinate of Satan, saved Christians. And I mean saved, saved, blood-washed, blood-bought Christians can be a subordinate of Satan. I gave a verse to definitely prove that. All right, the destiny of Satan. All right, his head will be bruised. All right, now that's a common, that's a common mistake you'll hear in church. They think that Satan's head was bruised at Calvary. That's totally false. It's future at the second advent. His head will be bruised, all right? Uh, Genesis 3, 14 through 15 and Romans 16, 20. Number two, he will confess Jesus is Lord. That's Philippians 2, 10 through 11. Three, he will burn in the lake of fire forever. Revelation chapter 20, verse 7 through 10. Okay, thus the study on Satan. Okay, intercessory work of Christ. 
Now let's just look at your next one. The intercession or intercessory work of Christ. All right, now, first section that I taught to you was the reason. Okay, what's the reason for his intercessory work? Okay, uh, I mentioned for one, he is interceding to God on our behalf, Hebrews 7, 25 and 9, 24. Now, that's obviously very important as a reading. Reason. We need such a being to intercede to God on our behalf because we just fail him every single day, man. All right, number two. In the past, Christ was a prophet. In the present, Christ is a priest. Uh, let's see. In the future, Christ will be a king. So that's interesting. And I gave you verses for all three. In all of history, no one was able to be a true prophet, priest, and king. That's important to know. No one in all of history was known to be a true prophet, priest, and king. Moses was pretty c close. He was known as a king, and he was a prophet, but he had to have Aaron as a priest. David, he was a king, and he was a prophet. He prophesied. But guess what? He wasn't a priest. So it's very interesting. Very interesting. Now, uh, the, there's a guy. Uh, wow, how can I forget? Melchizedek, duh. Okay, Melchizedek. He was known to be as a king, and he's a priest, see? But we're not sure about him being a prophet. Now, if he is, there are assertions that this Melchizedek during Abraham's time could have been a pre-incarnate of Jesus Christ. But we don't know. That's a totally different topic. Okay, anyway, the third point in this first section, when Job was accused, he wanted a mediator on his behalf. I explained that. So that's so needful. And then number four, we Christians have Christ as that mediator on our behalf, 1 Timothy 2, 5. And Jesus is the only one qualified to mediate between God and men since he is the only one, the only one, fully familiar with both God and man's natures. And if you don't, and if you don't think so, name me who then, huh? Who in all of history was both entirely God and entirely man? See that? Uh, that's found at 1 Timothy 3.16 and Hebrews 4.15. Okay, now the conditions of the high priest. Conditions of the high priest. Now this is really important. That way, because you got to realize this work that Jesus did, this intercession work, is not a walk in the park. Jesus can't say, okay, I intercede for you. No, he had to follow certain conditions. This is why it's going to make sense why Jesus did all of this at his sacrifice. Uh, one, he was taken from among men. Wasn't Jesus Christ doing, uh, didn't Jesus Christ do that for us? Uh, the high priest also, secondly, he was ordained or appointed for the task. Wasn't Jesus Christ, uh, didn't Jesus Christ do that for us? Number three, he was called of God. And wasn't Jesus Christ, didn't Jesus Christ do that? Number four, he served in the things pertaining to God. Number five, he offered gifts and sacrifices for sins. Number six, he entered the most holy place. That's, those are really strong conditions for the high priest. I mean, that's, like, that's higher than the conditions of being a pastor, okay? And uh, conditions of entering like a really high qualified job. See, this is very hard and special, but Jesus Christ fulfilled all of those. I gave all the verses on that one. Okay, the Okay, now, I know that maybe some of you were kind of lost, but basically I call this the Aaronic and Melchizedekian patterns of the high priest. Basically, Aaron and Melchizedek. These are two of the most important people. Melchizedek, sorry. These are the most important people in your whole Bible to find all the qualifications of the high priest and the importance of the high priest. Everything. If Jesus Christ followed these two men in pattern, he is known, he should be the ultimate high priest. Okay. One, Aaron offered sacrifice for the sins of the people, and Jesus Christ obviously did that. Number two, Aaron appeared in God's presence for the people. Jesus Christ obviously did that. Number three, Aaron blessed the people. Jesus obviously did that. Number four, Aaron did not live forever, but Jesus could. But that's why Jesus could take after Melchizedek, who is known as, quote, abideth a priest continually at Hebrews 7. 
And Jesus says he abideth the priest forever. Excuse me. So uh, Jesus followed all these patterns. All right, the sacrifice of the high priest. Sacrifice of the high priest. The sacrifice. The high priest had to offer the blood of animals, but Jesus Christ did better. He offered his own blood. Number two, high priest offered sacrifices continually, but Jesus Christ offered it finally. He didn't have to do it continually. So he's a better high priest. Number three, high priest offered sacrifice for his own sins with the blood of others to enter the Holy of Holies only once a year. But guess what? Jesus offered a sacrifice for the sins of others with his own blood, very own blood, not the blood of others, to enter the Holy of Holies forever. So he's a better high priest. Number four, the high priest daily offered sacrifice for his own sins first, then the people. But Christ offered it all time, uh, offered it all one time for the people. All right, plea of intercession. Okay, this is probably the most important part, maybe the most important in the intercessory work lesson. Okay, the plea of intercession. The basis of the plea is the blood. That is important. That's Hebrews 9. Uh, the actual plea, number two. So number one is the basis of the plea. Number two is the actual plea. The actual plea, now you can preach a sermon out of this and you'll feel like running around the room. So because of the blood, what's the actual plea? A, strength given to the weak. B, faith will not fail. C, corrects your prayers according to God's will. D, kept from sin and temptation. E, no condemnation. Woo, I, I can harp on that for a long time on each of them, but I got to get going for time's sake. All right, number three, the purpose of the plea. The purpose of the plea. Okay, the purpose of the plea, man, you can you feel like running again. A, we can enter the Holy of Holies in heaven. B, we can remain sinless. C, we can receive sympathy. D, we can approach God boldly without fear. E, we can have victory over temptations. You can literally preach two sermons just on this section on the plea. I mean, you can preach two different sermons on that. And then you can have, I can get people running around and shouting just on those things. I mean, it's really, I mean, this thing is the most important out of the intercessory work you understand. All right, the audio lesson will explain more, and then you'll understand better. All right, the advocacy of our intercessor. Okay. Man, here's another sermon I never thought of. So this one is kind of like a dramatic illustration, the advocacy of our intercessor. So how it works is like this, is that this is literally true. It's not just a dramatic illustration. Satan is accusing you at the courtroom of God day and night. That's proven at Revelation 12, 9 through 10. And then a good example of the case was how Satan did with Job before God. Now, Satan, though he might accuse you, we have Christ as our advocate and our intercessor with God. That literally says word for word advocate and intercessor. So that matches with that courtroom incident then. That's found at 1 John 1, 9, all the way through chapter 2 and verse 1. Now, a great example of how, that shows Satan accusing a Christian and God the judge would instead cleanse the Christian is found at Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. That passage is a very great illustration of how it would go in a courtroom setting, of how God would, God the judge would cover the saint where Satan would be the accuser. All right. The next one is quiet time. Quiet time. Okay, now this is one of my most favorite basic doctrines. Quiet time is probably one of my most important, one, one of my most important teachings on basic doctrines. Quiet time. So you're all going to like this one. All right, quiet time. That's basically, literally, you, hash it, you should have a quiet time moment. A lot of Bible believers, they just get so heavy and meet, meet, doctrine, 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 and so busy, so busy, and pastors are so busy and soul winning and building up a church, and people are so busy trying to pick up kids at the bus route and then grow a church, they don't make quiet time. Quiet time is the most important thing 
one of the most important things in your Christian life for a relationship with God, actually. So this is uh, an important lesson. Okay, quiet time. Okay, the introduction. Okay, so quiet time. So then the first section I gave an introduction on quiet time. Now in the introduction, I gave verses to explain it. I gave 1 Samuel 9, 27 and Psalms chapter 46, verse 10. Those are the two most important verses that tell you it's important to stand still and to be still and know so that you can hear the Lord, so that you can know the Lord. Trust me, when you're working like crazy in a job and taking care of family and kids and taking care of your spouse and then so busy with schoolwork, you really think that you can uh, think about and know God more intimately? Or it's when you stand still and press the pause button and you got nothing interfering not even technology and YouTube, <laughs> Facebook, see that? Just shut off everything and then just God. I think a great example, so let me just say this briefly so that uh, some of the people here can understand, like a summer camp, right? Shut off from all access, right? And because of that silent moment, we were able to fe feel much more close to God, right? So that's why it's so important, this is extremely important to have quiet time. Okay, uh, let's see. I also explained the emergence. Okay, now there's a heresy called the emergent movement, the emergent church movement. Basically, these churches are worse than non-denominational, non-denominational Joel Osteen type of churches. You gotta understand. The emergent churches is a major problem. They basically mix up Eastern religious practices within Christianity. So Rick Warren actually has some of that going on in his services with the Jesus prayers, he calls it, which is extremely dangerous. The, the emergency used Psalms chapter 46, verse 10, which I already gave to you, to prove contemplative prayer. Okay, contemplative prayer is basically, uh, it's kind of similar with uh, yoga, prayer, uh, yoga meditation, but basically you're repeating words when you pray and then you empty yourself. Okay, that kind of thing is demonic, and then I explained why that's not the case. Because uh, the easy argument is Psalms chapter 46, verse 10, when you actually read it. That doesn't support contemplative prayer. It supports the opposite. Psalms 46, says, 46 verse 10 says, be still and know that I am God. It's getting to know God. But contemplative prayer is not, is not, is not a time where you know God. Contemplative prayer is a time where you know devils. And that's proven in Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 through 45. I showed you right there in that passage uh, that emptying yourself inwardly, that is open to more demon possession. Not just demon possession, but more demon possession. That's getting to know devils intimately, not God. But not only that, uh, Matthew chapter uh, 8, I think, or I forgot the chapter, Jesus Christ, he, uh, so I didn't give this in this basic doctrine teaching, so you all can write this down and look it up yourself. But in the book of Matthew chapter 8, I think, or chapter 7, Jesus Christ says, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. Contemplative prayer is repeating and repeating words. See, it's like a chant. That's like, uh, I don't think God wants, I mean, if I talk to somebody, do you think they'd like to hear me repeat words to them and chant to them? Or just to regularly talk to them? See, it's the same thing with God. God's a person. I'm sure when, he, when, he, when, you want, when you talk to God and God wants to hear from you, He doesn't want you to hear you say, Oh Jesus, Oh Jesus, Oh Jesus, Oh Jesus, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord. I'm sure He doesn't want to hear that when He wants to talk to you. See that? Okay, uh, enough of that. In the intro, I mentioned what are some ways to know God personally in your quiet time. Okay, four ways to know God personally through quiet time in the intro that I taught. It's Bible reading one, two is prayer, three is memorizing scripture, and four is studying. Studying. Those four things, studying, and I, I don't mean YouTube, okay? And I don't mean your own research. I don't mean books. I mean studying the Bible, okay? Those four things will be very helpful. Okay, the purpose of quiet time. Purpose of quiet time. The purpose of quiet time is, one, it's a time of friendship with God. 
And two, it's to prepare yourself for spiritual attacks. That's why you understand why you need, you need, okay? It's not something you skip. You need this because you're going to die, okay, because based on those two purposes. All right, the next one is suggestions for quiet time. Okay, so I gave you a lot of helpful tips. Suggestions for quiet time is to do it in the morning or night. I gave a verse on that. Number two, prevent it from being mechanical. I gave a verse on that. All of these points I gave, I proved with verses, okay? Uh, number three, prevent it from being disorderly. Number four, do it frequently. Number five, confess sins beforehand. Number six, ask for revelation. Number seven, find a special place. Now, trust me, this will dramatically change your quiet time. You'll feel more intimate with God and you'll feel something change within you. All right, problems of quiet time, problems. The devil doesn't want you to spend time with God, so there will obviously be problems. One is interruptions from the devil. Two is distractions of the mind. Oh, yeah. Number three, sleepiness. Oh, yeah. Number four, a wrong spirit. Number five, weakness of flesh. And I'm sure we all can say amen on all five. <laughs> Everyone can agree with that. All right, examples of quiet time. So I gave you three cases here of people. I don't know of any other people in the Bible who are known to be this close to God except these three people. Do you know why? Because they had quiet time with God, these three people. So I don't know of any other person who had more intimate relationship with God than these three people. If you want to be one of the top people in heaven, that's why quiet time is necessary. So here are three people. Abraham. Why? He was called the friend, friend of God. No one was called that. And you can notice why. He talked with God at night. He had a special place to talk with God. He always listened attentively to God. And he isolated himself to be alone with God. See? See, it relates to quiet time. You can see that. All right. The second example is David. No other person was called a man after my own heart, but David was. So that is very interesting. Why? Quiet time. He talked with God early in the morning and even late at night. He memorized scripture and he read the scriptures early day and late at night. So that shows he was extremely hungry. He really delved into the scriptures often. The third person, Jesus Christ. He, no other person was described as, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. You and I are sons of God, but God never said that about any son except Jesus Christ. And you can guess why, his quiet time. He prayed all night. He prayed early in the morning. He isolated himself to be alone with God. And he daily, daily knew the scripture. So he studied a lot. So... Uh, listen to the audio again. I encourage you, if, if you all never thought of it that way before, after I reviewed this, it's extremely important quiet time. Life-changing. It'll change your life. Okay, the fourth one. All right, this is the most important homework you had in this discipleship class. The most important homework to debunk and argue for your faith, to debunk uh, the the different religions and argue for your faith. It's this one. Okay, I talked about the deity and personality of the spirit. Now, I'm going to go through this very briefly. I'm not sure if I covered this in the audio lesson, so maybe stuff in this video may be slightly different. Okay, the first thing is this, is that the Holy Spirit, he's definitely a person, all right? He's not a thing. Now, I've proven this uh, through Greek and Hebrew, so I went through a little bit of Greek and Hebrew here. So the thing is this, is that in Greek, the JWs and Garner Ted Armstrong and cults, they'll try to argue that the spirit, the Holy Spirit is a thing. Why? Because in Greek, the word spirit is in neuter form, neuter form in Greek. So that proves the spirit is a thing. But that's obviously debunked. The reason why is this, just because in Greek, it's given a gender, all right? Now, if you know different languages, you'll know something here. 
In different languages, it will be given different genders. Spanish has that. Uh, different language, uh, Greek has that. A lot of other languages have that. It's a no-brainer. For example, uh, the Greek word for heart is cardia, but that's feminine gender, gender. So is the heart a female? No. Another example, the Greek word for child is technon, and that's neuter. Is a child a thing, a neuter form, or a person? It's a per the child's a person, see? So see, just uh, in Greek language, it's assigned genders. That doesn't mean it has to be a female, it has to be a male, or it has to be a thing. Okay, that's just common sense in languages. So if some JW acts smart with you on that one, you just can basically make the JW look like a fool by saying, you know what, uh, do you speak, uh, oh, wait a minute, aren't you, a, a, do you speak Spanish? And a lot of, we have a lot of Hispanic JWs there. If they argue that, they've got to be the dumbest people on the planet. Because the reason why is that they know in their own language, Spanish, they even have female uh, gender forms for uh, objects, as well as neuter gender forms and male gender forms for all uh, for uh, all kinds of things and people. So this is a no-brainer. So make them look foolish with this, okay? Make them look foolish with this. All right. The Holy Spirit is said to have a mind, okay? So the Holy Spirit is not just an energy or thing, okay? Because Romans 8:27 shows he has a mind. The Holy Spirit experiences emotions, slights, and injur injuries. Energy does not do that. Matthew 12, 31. Can you blaspheme energy? Hebrews 10, 29. Can you insult energy? Acts chapter 5, verse 3. Can you lie to energy? Romans 15, verse 30. Can you love energy? I urge you by the love of the Spirit. Can energy love? See? Ephesians 4.30 and Isaiah 63 verse 10. Energy can be grieved. <laughs> See that? Uh, if I didn't cover that in the audio, then you can re-watch this video, press pause and rewind, and then write down those verses. Look at the verse and study it for yourself, and that way you can write the notes. Okay, another thing. The Holy Spirit evaluates, reasons, and chooses with intelligent free will, which energy cannot do. All right? And this is proven with John chapter 16, verse 13, that he does not speak of his own, but whatever he hears, he will speak. Acts 15, 28, it seemed good to us and the Holy Ghost. 1 Corinthians 2, 11, the Holy Spirit knows God's thoughts. John 16, 13, he will guide you. Acts 13, 1 through 4, the Holy Spirit selected people to send out. Acts chapter 16, verse 6, the Holy Spirit forbade the apostle to go to a region. Acts chapter 11, verse 12, he assigned Peter to go with Cornelius' men. Acts chapter 8, verse 39, uh, the Holy Spirit caught Philip away. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, and chapter 1, verse 12, and Luke chapter 4, verse 1, he led Jesus away into the wilderness. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, the Holy Spirit selected you people as overseers. All right, another thing is that the Holy Spirit, he communicates with a person. He communicates with this person. So this is definitely a person. This is proven at these verses, John 16, 13, Revelation 22, 17, Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, verse 11, verse 17, Acts chapter 21, verse 11, and Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 7. All right. Oh, wow. That's a lot. Okay, the, so you, you got to believe the Holy Spirit is the person after this, basically. Okay, so you got a lot of ammunition in your hand. Okay, here's another one. The Holy Spirit assists us in ways that another person would, uh, would not, uh, that only a person can do. He helps our weaknesses, Romans 8, 26. He intercedes for us, Romans 8, 26. He is a helper, like an advocate and lawyer. That's John 14, 16, chapter 17, verse 26. Uh, excuse me, John chapter 14, verse 16, verse 17, verse 26, and chapter 16, verse 7. Compare that with 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. All right, the Holy Spirit, it takes actions of intelligent free will, which energy obviously cannot do. 
1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, the Holy Spirit decides, wills, which spiritual gift one particular individual will receive in the whole body of Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, the same Spirit worketh all those things. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, the Spirit searches all things. Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, the Spirit and the Bride invites the people to come. See? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, He baptized us into Jesus Christ. All right, now here's the fun part. Now that we talked about the personality of the Holy Spirit, the deity, you can even use J.W., their own Bible, the New World Translation, to prove the Holy Spirit is God. Now, in the audio, uh, I may have done it differently. So in this video, you might hear something different. Every single one of these verses I'm going to give to you in video is solely from the New World Translation, Jehovah Witness Bible. So you can prove Holy Spirit is God through here. John chapter 4, verse 24. It says God is a spirit. Boom. Holy Spirit is God. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Paul warns them to not draw away from God be, by explaining about the children of Israel drawing away from the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is proven to be God in this case. Especially since Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 through 12. Hebrews 3 is the Holy Spirit speaking. But you know what Hebrews 3 is quoting from? Psalms chapter 95, which the New World Translation will say Jehovah is speaking. Because they like to replace Lord with Jehovah all over. They just made a big boo-boo. <laughs> all right, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 through 18. It basically says word for word. Jehovah is the Spirit. New World Translation. Because <laughs> they replace Lord with Jehovah. <laughs> what are they going to do? Not only that, it, it says Jehovah is the Spirit and Jehovah the Spirit. Boom, right there. Uh, Acts chapter 5, verse 3 through 4. Ananias was lying to the Holy Ghost, but Peter explained to Ananias, when you are lying to the Holy Ghost, you are lying to God. Uh, Acts chapter 21, verse 4 and verse 11. And Acts chapter 22, verse 18 through 19. It shows that the Holy Spirit warned Paul to not go to Jerusalem. And you know what Paul called him? Paul called him Lord. <laughs> All right, Acts chapter 28, verse 25. That's the Holy Spirit speaking there. But Acts 28, 25 is a quotation from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8 through 9. And guess who's speaking there? Jehovah. What are you going to do? Now, here's a better argument. If you deny that the quote in Acts 28.25 is not Jehovah speaking, then to what verse is Paul referring to in Acts 28.25? If not Isaiah 6, 8 through 9, what verse was Paul quoting from? Then Paul would be lying. There you go with the deity and of the Holy Spirit. All right, now, I think in the audio, I did it much differently from this video. So I'd advise to listen to both audio and this video. That way you can have a better combination of a better outline for the deity and personality of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we covered everything important in discipleship. Uh, your homework assignment will be the next four basic doctrine teachings. And I will post them uh, usually at the end credits after this video. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works 
through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you can say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his, to set up his kingdom even more, there are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.